I used to look back on 2018, my $30 million year, my, you know, biggest song in the world, all this other stuff. And I used to be scared. Like, I hope this isn't the pinnacle. Like, I hope this isn't the height of me as logic. Like, I really, I really hope. And then I started being like, well, why not? Are you like a, a night owl musician or are you like a regular normal human being? <laughs> I think uh, a majority of my life I was a night owl. I still am a night owl, like in general, um, for different reasons. Uh, when I was younger, I would just be up all night because my schedule was just completely messed up. Like I remember right. going to sleep at like 1 p.m. type shit. And then I, yeah. and then it, can I cuss? Yeah, of course. Can of I course. curse? Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, swag. Uh, but yeah, so it's it's like that. Now it's a little different. Um, I still work in the day, whether it's music or working on scripts or writing or whatever the case may be. Um, but there's just something special about nighttime, especially knowing that like my son's asleep, like he's safe, my wife is asleep, like I've spent my time with my family and now and now I get this for myself. So yeah. Yeah, when I was working on that project, they'd be like, all right, let's meet at two at the studio. And I'd be like, in the afternoon? And they'd be like, no, in the morning. That's when we're getting oh, started. Man. And yeah, I don't I don't know how a human can function that way. It's it's totally insane. Which it, it was funny, too, because then you listen to rap music and they talk about, you know, like we, we're rapping at 3 a.m. in the studio or whatever. And it's like, yeah, your day just started. You, you're not pulling like a 19 hour day like you just got up. Yeah, it's funny. But we used to go, we used to go hard. We'd, we'd go like 4 p.m. Uh, in, in my early days working on my first album was when we had studio time that we're paying for. Sure. You know, $2,500 a day and we're in there for like nine months straight. Um, it was like, literally we'd get there at four and we'd leave at like six, seven in the morning and then just go do it all over again. Well, I love, I love the book. I thought it was very good. It, it's interesting to think about your journey. Yeah. From even from that point to where you are now, sort of semi retired working on other projects, it, it, it must be, you must sort of pinch yourself. Like it must be so different your day-to-day -day existence from where you started. Yeah. I mean, from what, I mean, dude, yeah. I started in this basement of my friend's house. You know what I mean? I started in the guest room of my godmother's crib in Gaithersburg, Maryland, like bumfuck middle of nowhere. So for me, um, now it's just incredible. Like, I love it. I love, I love where I am now because I had to pay so many dues and work so hard. Um, and it's just like, you're working in a way that's so ignorant because you, you have, like, you have to be crazy. There's this part of you that has this dream that is so unattainable. Like, it's sure. like, yeah, I want to be a big rap star. Like, yeah, right. Like that is like never going to happen. But luckily I didn't have that. I guess, I mean, it's weird. Cause I saw it with realism at the same time, you know, and I talk about it in the book. It's like, I built a brand. I wasn't like, Oh yeah, bitches and hoes and, and right. boats and yachts. Like, you know, like I yeah. was like, okay, I'm going to brand myself. Who am I? I'm a nerd. I'm of mixed race, but I look white. There's not really anybody like me out there rapping. I'm, uh, you know, I, I like sci-fi and shit. Like th these are the things I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about this peace, love, and positivity. I'm going to be myself and hopefully it will work. And I think that's why it did work because I looked at it from a business standpoint, not like, Oh, I'm trying to get rich or I'm trying to this, or, I'm trying to that. I always made music from my heart and I think people connected with it. Also, it was just such a different time. Um, like I, I tell people today, even my manager, I'm like, dude, I have no idea like in the world how I would make it today as an artist. Everything is so oversaturated. I think there's like a million songs a day or some crazy sh like that that's released. Like I wouldn't know what to do. I came up on music blogs, dude. Like this was like I came up in an era. Sorry for going on. No, no. I came up in an era where Twitter and Instagram didn't realize what they had. They didn't realize even what they were. So it's like I was able to utilize those platforms to promote my music and nobody else was doing that. And then, yeah, now the things you would have to do to break through the noise, they're not, it's not a good incentive. It makes you not good. The things you have to Dude, do to even break myself, through. like, like literally I have like six something million followers on Instagram. I can't reach them all. Right. And the reason that I can't reach them is because now it's pay to play. So yeah. it's like, I spent my entire life 
garnering, you know, getting those, those fans and those people. And if I post something, the algorithm has changed in a way. Cause I used to wonder like, man, why is it that I would get like millions of likes on a picture? Even all this is so fucking stupid and I'm so over it and I'm off the internet. But when I was on the internet and that's why, because it rewards you, the more you're on it, the more you engage, the more you, this, the more it lets you, you know, have the followers that you have actually be able to see what you do. And in the last two and a half years that I've been basically utterly off, uh, you know, these platforms, it like penalizes you for it. And I went from a million likes on a, on a post to like a hundred thousand, 200,000. And then as a, as a, as a person, you start to equate your worth to that. So you're like, Oh, I'm not as popping as I was. I'm not as this, as I was that, as I was, but I wised up and was like, first of all, I don't need any of that shit, you know, to, to justify my worth or, 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 you know, um, who I am as a man, but I just think it is kind of BS that they, that they do that to you. you spend your whole life building something. And then they just, at the flip of, you know, switch, they just go, no, we're going to do things a little differently now. So if you really want this, you either got to pay us or you have to engage constantly. And it's just kind of messed up. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a weird thing. It's obviously a very privileged place to be, but you're, if you know how the game is played and you know, what gets attention, you can like, you're on a show or you're talking to someone, or you're doing something and you're like, I know what I could do in this situation that would make this thing front page news or would would make, it would get tons of attention, but you have to go like, do I actually want that? Is that who I want to be? Is that good? And I think some artists aren't in a position to say no to that because they need to break through. So it's a tricky thing. And a majority of it is negativity. Let's just yes. be real. It's like, fuck you and you ain't shit and blah, blah, blah. And I fucked your bitch and blah, all this stuff. And it's just like, okay, that, that's another reason why, like, I kind of wanted to retire. It's funny. Cause I was like, I'm retiring. And then like 11 months later, I'm like, I'm back. Like it's, <laughs> it seems crazy, Yeah. but what it really was, it was just a, it was just a state of mind. So it's like, I created what I'd like to think is my opus. My last album, no pressure for me is a culmination of like, a hungry kid on his come up, but I'm 30. So I'm not rapping about dumb shit. You know what I mean? I'm rapping about being sure. a, a dad and a, a good husband. Like you don't really hear that in rap. It's very rare. Sure. So, but I was like, I'm just going to be myself do this. I mean, I put every ounce of, of my entire career into like this one album. Um, because for the, for a few years before then I'd been like known kind of in the pop world. So I was making more pop records, making songs with Eminem and Marshmallow and, you know, 1-800 came out and it was just, so I was just, honestly, I was riding the train. I was still always making music from my heart, but I was like, Oh, I can make, okay, crazy. Like for me, 2018 was a $30 million year because I was smart about it. You know what I mean? So I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. And I set myself up to then be able to do what I want when I want. Um, now, but it's, it's just a crazy thing to think like, yeah, if I, you know, throw my middle fingers up and talk trash about an artist that I actually like, like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, but that's what this world does to you. And it isn't just hip hop, but it is a very prominent thing in hip hop and always has been that it's like, you're not as good as me. You're not as this as me. You're not as that as me. And then it kind of pits people against each other. Like I've never been in a, a rap beef in my life. There's a lot of rap beefs with logic, right? But I was never in one of them. Sure. And I've had I've had basically every single person that ever talked shit about me later come up to me and be like, Hey man, I'm sorry about what I said. And <laughs> you was just you was just really popping off. And if I'm gonna be real, man, I was just I was just kind of jealous, man. Blah, blah, blah. And then we have this conversation. And then I open I open them with, you know, I welcome them with open arms because the way I see it is we're all just kids, man. You know, that's kind of one thing I've been, I've realized like while doing the press, I've been saying that uh, while doing press for this book, like we are like, how can you tell a little six year old kid? Like you fucking suck. You're a piece of shit. Your ideas are garbage. Your way of thinking is trash. Like you, you, unless you were a truly mentally ill person, you wouldn't say that to a child. And when I look at you, when I look at my reflection, when I look at all Travis Scott and Rihanna and Drake and this, I just see like young, pure artists at heart who are doing something because they love it. Um, and yet they all get shit on constantly 24 seven by the internet being told what they should do or what they shouldn't do, or their last album wasn't this enough or that enough. And that's another thing that I fucking hate about rap. Now this is all getting back into the retirement, right? Is Every album has to be the greatest album that ever, or you fell off, you're over, it's done. I was randomly on on the internet 
like because my my uh, my assistant gave me his phone because he posts everything, but I just wanted to write something personally myself. And like one of the first comments I see is like, you fell off. And I'm like, bro, I sold a quarter million fucking units in my first week of my album last year, like less than a year ago. What do you like? What sure. does this even mean? Um, and I laughed it off. But what I'm saying is, is I wanted to leave that. So it's not even that I really wanted to leave music. I wanted to leave. I can take criticism. There's a di- there's a big difference between, oh, these hi hats aren't aren't you know, or they're too loud, or the mixing on this is weird, or I'm not sure I really understood his message. There's a difference between that and, hey, yo, this motherfucker suck ass, dog. Like, there's a big difference. So I didn't want to subject myself to that any longer. And then after doing that and taking time away, mind you, I was still making music every day because I do it from my heart. I realized, oh. I can release music. It's all here. There is no spoon, man. It's like, okay, I'm going to start dropping music and it doesn't have to be the greatest album ever created. It doesn't have, I'm just going to have fun. If you're like me, you grew up eating the sugariest, most unhealthy cereal you could possibly imagine. You can't even wrap your head around how your parents allowed you to do this. And now that you're older, you want to eat healthier. You want your kids to eat healthy, but you still love the delicious taste of cereal. That's what I love about Magic Spoon. It's high protein, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, wheat free, totally delicious. I just absolutely love it. 13 grams of protein, only five net carbs, zero grams of sugar. It's just the best cereal. I don't eat cereal in the morning most times, but I do have it for dessert a lot of days. Just absolutely great. We pick these wild blackberries on our farm. I eat that in there, but check it out. I think there's free shipping with your order. You can use code Ryan Holiday. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video and this podcast. Seriously, it's legit delicious. I love that. There's a there's a story that I tell in one of my books about Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch-22, and Kurt Vonnegut, who wrote Slaughterhouse-Five. And they're at this party of this billionaire. And... Uh, uh, Kurt Vonnegut is teasing Joseph Heller uh, and he says, you know, how does it feel to know that the guy whose house we're in, some billionaire or whatever, made more money uh, this week than your book will make in its lifetime? And he says, well, I have something that that guy doesn't have. And he says, what could that possibly be? And he says, I know what enough is. And well, I love that story because it's not, you know, after Joseph Heller writes Catch-22, he doesn't stop writing books. That's not the end of it. I think it's a difference between doing something from a place of needing to prove something or needing to like be something and from a place of fullness where you're just like happy with who you are and you actually enjoy the work itself. Dude. I'm going to tell that story forever. <laughs> it's a great that story. So it's incredible, man. I was, uh, so there's a, um, incredible radio personality who goes by the name of big boy. He's got a show called big boys neighborhood. And I remember talking to, I, I need to call him, make sure I call big boy, man. Cause he's a good dude. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A couple of years ago, like two years ago, this is just before I moved to the middle of nowhere. Um, I was on the phone with him having a conversation and he brought up enough. He was like, everything's just about enough this and enough that. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, the whole game is you're not good enough. You're not cool enough. You're not big enough. You're not popular enough. You're not strong enough. You're not tough enough. You're not gangster enough. You're not black enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. And I was like, oh my God. And he goes, I know that I am good enough. And I was just like, holy shit. And it's true. We, we're, we're kind of almost brainwashed in a way that – you know, if, if I'm not doing Drake numbers, like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if I'm not doing this, if I'm not doing that, it's like, I've done Drake numbers. I have billions of streams. Like I've done that, Yeah. but maybe now I'm not doing it like I was, but I, I also am focused, you know, um, a, a, like one of the critiques that I've had in the last few years is like, Oh, he's not like hungry anymore. Like, like he's not that he's not rapping. Like he's on his come up. Like music isn't his everything to those three things. I say, of course, I'm not hungry. Like my fridge has been full for quite some time. So when I step to the mic now it's dessert, it's cause yeah. I enjoy it. It's yeah. fun. Um, no, I'm not a skinny little kid on his come up anymore. I'm not, I'm accomplished. I'm an accomplished man. And I understand that. And then three, you're right. Music is not my everything anymore. My son is, and my wife, 
So it's like, well, this is what you get from me. And I don't think that that's any worse. I think it's just more mature. Um, but in hip hop, it's always about the struggle and the grind and the this. And bro, I struggle, but like I struggle j- to juggle millions of dollars. Like <laughs> I struggle to make sure I can pay my employees. And sometimes you got to let certain people go so that you can like those. Yeah, I have champagne problems, but hey, man, that's what I'm dealing with. Like I've already been broke. I've already been on food stamps. I've already been surrounded by drug addicts and violence and murder and guns i've already cooked crack i've already like i already did it and i wrote about it so i think i think yeah i'm gonna wrap about being a good dad when you think about the 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 most popular sort of rap movie of all time or popular with rappers what does tony montana have in his house the world is not enough that there is no such thing as enough that you never feel good that you can never feel happy with yourself but the the irony of that movie is that it's a cautionary tale. I mean, he fucking dies. It's a horrible yeah. it's a horrible cautionary tale of what happens when you can never be satisfied and you're willing to do anything to get more. Yeah, dude, enough. Like that's the thing. Like I, th- I think that's the word of of this uh conversation. Like literally I was on this hamster wheel. I I thought about killing myself. And, and then I was like, oh, 1-800 guy can't kill himself. He'll just be a meme. <laughs> like, like, it's crazy. Like, like, I found myself so depressed. I had anything, everything I could have ever wanted, and yet I wasn't happy. And the reason that I wasn't happy is because I was doing it for other people. And sure. there were people in my pocket that got paid uh, when I got paid. So then it's like, you got to go on this tour. You got to go on this to this festival. You got to do this opportunity. You got to go, go, go. And then I'm, I'm hearing, excuse me, I'm hearing things like, oh, man, you know, this, this isn't going to last forever, man. Like, and then I'm like, shit, well, how's that supposed to make me feel? And that, da, 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 da. and then before you know it, you're just like emaciated. You're mentally unstable. You're in a place uh, of just total and complete despair and unhappiness. And that's just not a place that I, w- I, I wanted to be. And, and like I said, it's just like, okay, I've, I've already, I already had a number one. And then I had several consecutive number ones, whether it's number one overall albums, number one hip hop albums, number one song, number one this, number one that. Well, who gives a shit? Like, and I've been saying like the only, I I have accomplished every single thing that you could accomplish as a musician, um, except win a Grammy. Hey JT, can you hand me that, uh, that, that plaque right there? I want to show you something cool. Just please don't break it. I think it's on. I think it's on a nail. No, this. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one with the handwriting on it. Yeah, just grab that shit real quick. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm going to show you something there. Hopefully, there's not too much glare. Yeah, I can okay. see it. So this, this says me practicing my autograph, and if my memory serves me correct, because I can't look at it right now. 2010. It was 2010. Eight years later. That is a platinum ticket for selling out Madison Square Garden. This is like probably my favorite thing. And I don't even look at it because it shows me like, dude, you did it. And you did it in eight years. And uh, here you go, JT. Thank you so much. And it's like, I don't think I've ever showed anybody that really. And cool. Well, yeah. then what? What are you just going to do? Fucking Madison Square Garden 20 times in a row? Like, geez, bro, have a life. Like, you're good enough, man. Go do other things. And that's where I'm at now. Like, now I just wrote this film. I'm funding it myself, starring in it. I got a great director. It's just going to be awesome, and I'm going to have a blast doing it. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to spend $2 million. Like, nobody just wants to drop $2 million on something unless it's like a house. But I do not want to look back and be filled with regret. And I also – I've been – kind of in the in the film game for a couple of years and it's always a million cooks in the kitchen and one director loves it or the head of film loves it but then the head of film changes and then it's this and da, 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 da. and then there you are with this amazing script that they bought for 500 grand but now it's yours again because three years have gone by and it's like you know what screw this i'm gonna do what i love well here i have a grammy story for you hang on one sec hey so I've had, I've had my number ones as an author, uh, so I, I know what you're talking about on, on a smaller scale. But a couple of years ago, uh, I was an associate producer or something. It was a, a favor to a friend who was doing a jazz album. And uh, the jazz album got nominated for a Grammy. So I went to the Grammys as a producer, got to go up on stage, it won, it won a Grammy. Uh, 
for the for the second tier, you know, there's like the real Grammys, and then there's like the the other categories, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you I mean, go it's up, all real. It's, of course, it's real. But th- this is the story. So I go up on stage. We we all accept the Grammy. There's only one of them. They only give one, but there's like ten producers on the album, right? So I was like, do we get one? And they're like, no, you got to buy. You got to go online and buy your own. So uh, I buy I buy the Grammy, um, and uh, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put a little plaque on it. So I put a plaque on it. Right. The plaque says, when you die, this will go in the trash with all your other accomplishments. Right. And, and to me, it's a reminder of like, the, 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 what are people going to do with that or any of the things that you have accumulated in your life, no matter how successful you are? It does. None of it really matters. What matters is sort of who you were as a person. And did you leave anything like on the table as far as your creative potential. To me, that's what's interesting. Not how many copies did you sell, how successful you were, how many tours did you do, how many people did you support, whatever. But like, did you do your best while you were in the game? To me, that's what matters. Everything else is garbage. I completely agree. I think it's so fucking cool you have a Grammy. It's Uh, not a real Grammy. Again, you have to buy it. But I did win. I was on a producer on an album that won a Grammy. Yeah, dude, you won a Grammy. Um, And yeah, no, I agree. I think for me, it's not about, uh, I mean, none of this shit we can take with us and we can pass it along, but given enough time on this earth, it'll all become garbage anyway, right? So it's like, for me, I would rather do the best that I possibly can to instill good values in my son, uh, be a a good uh, friend, father, son-in-law, um, because that's the shit that really like kind of shapes the world, even though it's so minute. If I'm, if I'm being a good guy and you're being a good guy and she's being a good woman and you know, X, Y, Z, it's like that, that will kind of uh, trickle down. So, so especially in my music, spreading the message, peace, love, and positivity, be yourself. Don't worry, follow your dreams, do what you love. It could sound cliche, but somebody has got to say it and I'm more than happy to do it. Well, let's say uh, 1-800 doesn't do a billion streams. It doesn't become what it is. I've got to imagine, though, you'd still be very happy with that song from the human beings that you've heard from who it did something for. 100%, man. I mean, that's that's the only reason I wrote it. It was the first idea I had for the album, Everybody, that it's on. And it was the last song that I did because I dreaded it because I was like, oh, God, I don't want to put myself in this place and write this song, but I, I need to do it. You know, I want to do it. Sure. I want to help people. I want people to know they're not alone. And, you know, and it's such a stigma. It's like, bro, it's kind of crazy in the last three years, especially around the time that song came out, how much mental health is like a big part of kind sure. of the conversation now. now. I'm not saying it's something I started. I'm saying people before me started that kid Cuddy, you go even, even long before him, but people being open with their emotions. And I, I nobody was in the studio. Like, I don't want to be a laugh. This is going to be a banger dog. Like nobody. Right. And that's why I love it. Actually. I love it so much. Well, I loved it and then I hated it. And now I love it again, <laughs> which happens I think with any like hit record. Right. Sure. So it's like, I loved it because I made it purely from my heart. I was not thinking about this, that, or the third. And then it became this huge thing. And then everywhere I go, I'm surrounded by death and sadness and suicide. And it's really sad. And then it kind of engulfs you because like you're the suicide guy and everywhere you go, like people are just talking about death, 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 death. And then I got to take a break. And now I think, I, I, I mean, I can't tell you how proud I am of the song. I'm excited to do it. And I, it's kind of cool to know I have one of those songs that's going to be on like now music compilation 58. Like it's kind of dope that I could sure. go anywhere. I think in my life for the rest of my life and play at least just that one song and people who aren't even hip hop heads could know it and appreciate it. It makes me feel uh, well, what is the thing about mental health where somehow people think it's like a weakness or, or, Whatever. It's like, if you're not around, how tough are you actually? Right. Like, uh, so it's a, it's a strange thing. Rap especially has that weird uh, sort of catch up on that where it's like, how is, how it's always made me laugh. Like how rap is associated with like tough guys and violence. It's like, you guys sing and write poetry. That's what your job is. Right. Like not, and I say that as a person who, who likes poetry, right? Like I'm a writer. So I think what I like about your persona too, is that it's honest. You're like, I like music. I like art. I like creative things. That's who I am. Yeah. It's so weird that rap tries to be the exact opposite of what it actually is. 
it's the gladiator man in the coliseum dude so like if you go back to um what hip-hop was built upon right it's built on sugar hill gang it's built on cool mo d and dj cool Irk and run dmc and you know i'm black and i'm proud and you know spread love throughout our community and blah 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 which is great but then you know you also have another uh another poet telling his life that he sees. And what he sees is bitches on the street and Cadillac grills and he sells crack cocaine and he does all this. And I think at first, even if you go back and really listen to it, there was some braggadocia to it for sure. I mean, that's what hip hop was built upon, sure. braggadocia. It's like, I'm the best and I got the mic and motherfucker wanna fuck with me. And it's like, it's funny, you know what I mean? It's fun, sure. it's cool. Um, but then somehow, okay, we want to see the gladiator die. We want to see the blood. We want to see the lions. So it's just everything. I mean, look at film, cinema. Look at Shakespeare, man. You know, fucking Romeo and Juliet. They're dying. People are like, this is awesome. Like, there's something about death and destruction that we are so, like, it's it's like almost compulsive that we, like, have to view this. It's why everyone loves World Star, and everybody at some point has seen, seen like, a fight on YouTube. Like, right. it just is what it is. Um even if you don't want it, even if you don't like it, you're like, oh my God. But like, I'll see like the bully, like, I, like, like what is it called? Like, bu- like revenge or, or uh, whatever, karma. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I kind of love watching those videos and seeing a bully get punched in his face. But at the end of the day, it's like, oh no, nobody should be getting punched in their face. Like, this isn't good, but like, right. repeat. So I think it stems from that. And another thing, especially in hip hop is the misogyny. So yeah. this is all this sure. all stems back down to mental health and feelings and having conversations. So it's like, oh no, nah, that's pussy shit, man. Like women talk about their feelings, bruh. And then we perpetuate this notion that men, uh, and we're teaching our, these young boys that they're essentially not allowed to have emotions. So then they deal with those emotions in different ways. Instead of sitting down and having a conversation with your wife or your girlfriend and saying, you really hurt me when you did this. No. Nah, you know, a motherfucker will like punch her in the face or whatever the case may be. And that isn't just in hip hop, mind you. It really isn't. I mean, it's in rock and roll. It's in this, it's in that. Sure. I mean, it's just in society. And it's a very terrible thing. So I think there is a bit of misogyny as well that goes into like, oh, emotions are for women. And it's like, bro, we're all human beings, though. Like, what are you talking about? Well, yeah. And when you come from poverty or dysfunction, what you're really talking about is the trauma or generational trauma that's not being dealt with. So I think the mental health stuff is so important because like, first off, like when, when I, especially the early pages in your book, it's like, not only uh, was that horrible, nobody deserves to have gone through what you went through, but I think people struggle with the idea of like, okay, but I did go through it and now I have to deal with it. Now I have to go through it in therapy or uh, sobriety or what, now I actually have to deal with this painful trauma that I went through as a kid, or uh, as you're talking about, you're going to perpetuate that cycle on the next generation, either through your art or through your own children. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, I think for me, it it was always a form of um, not even just self-expression, but just therapy. Right. So I get to write like while I'm in, you know, uh, a terrible situation or with my mother who was not really the best example as a parent, I'm writing about that. I'm writing about not wanting to be on food stamps anymore. And I'm writing about uh, these different things, which is actually really funny. I, I don't really, I don't know that I mentioned this so much in my book, but it's funny. Cause like I'd write a rap and then I'd show my mom and I'm like, life is hard, man. This shit gets crazy. And then she like blows up on me. And is like, why are you fucking cursing you motherfucker? Like that's my mom. Yeah. Uh, which is hilarious. So I'm, I, so then I'm like torn, like taken aback and I'm like, okay, here's this woman who's cursing all the time, but I'm actually using it as a form of self-expression. So there's some people who just don't like curse words and blah, 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 and whatever. I mean, shit's a little more lenient, right? Just nowadays. Yeah. I don't know why, but cause we're all going to hell, I guess. But, um, when I say fuck, man, I mean that shit. Like, I love that word. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I, yes, I can be articulate and ex- express myself in various ways, but it's just like, sometimes that's what I like to say. So when you're, when you're trying to express yourself um, in this way, and then you're shot down, especially by someone like your own mother, who she was a writer. She never had anything published and she wrote on loose leaf paper, but she was a writer. And she, you know, I think that's a part of like where I get it from. But um, that therapy, man, it started there. It started, I, there was nobody to listen to what I had to say except the page. Um, but I think, dude, just being open with yourself, being honest, like, 
mental health is so important. Uh, uh, it is anyway. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think it is. Uh, and it is, it is nice to see it as a trend in sports and music and art, uh, as a thing. And, and yet it's so funny. Like uh, we just went through this with the Olympics with, with Simone Biles, where she was like, I'm not feeling it. It's not working. What's always so amazing to me is the incredibly strong opinions that other people have about things people are doing in their life to take care of themselves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, story of my life, bro. It's like yeah. whether it's even to take care of yourself or to express yourself or to be yourself, or to, all, to be yourself. It's like other people. But I think so many folks are just not happy in their own skin. Right. Yeah. So it's like I step up on stage and I'm like, hey, guys, I'm black, but like not really. But I am. But like and then people are like, <laughs> like, it's just like, oh, chill, bro. Like, why yeah. is it such a big deal? It's like literally everybody in my family's black. Like, think about this for a moment. In 2018, when I released my album, Everybody, it was like um, people. All right. I don't know how much of the book you got through, but it's like all people it. called it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you, you know, sometimes you do this and people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. I know I, how that I goes. Can tell you know what you're talking about, but I appreciate yeah. it. So, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is it's like, when I released everybody, it was the first time in my professional career that I ever actually really expressed myself about my race. So constantly it was like, oh, white. So you're white, you're white, you're white. And then I'm in these, doing these interviews and I'm like, well, no, I'm, my dad's black. Like I'm, I'm a, a mixed race. Like that's yeah. how I identify. Right. And most people are like, oh, cool. And then it's not really a thing, but in hip hop, Overall, as I got bigger and bigger, it became this like huge thing where it's like, there's no way, man. Like, you're not black. You're not this. You're not. This. Yeah. And it's just a fight. It's like an argument. And so uh, for me, kind of dealing with all this, it was just really weird because on three songs on an album for the first time in my career, I just express that. I say, hey, man, I'm black and I'm white and this is me. And then it became a fucking meme. So it became like a like biracial meme. Like everyone, I'm biracial. And they're like making fun of me. But nobody's nobody's going like, I'm Asian. I'm I'm black. Like, what? That's like so racist. Like, do you know what I mean? And you yeah. have these like people of all colors, especially white people, I would see doing it. Kind of being like, oh, he's biracial. That's all he talks about. That's all he talks about. And I also say in the book where it's like, you got cats like Black Thought, Killer Mike, Kendrick Lamar. I'm black. I'm blacker than black. I'm the blackest black, black. Like every fucking song, they talk about how proud they are to be black. And it's amazing. And then I go, hey, guys, guess what? I'm two things at the same time. And they're like, shut the fuck up. And they, they, they just so, and I couldn't understand it. And the reason I couldn't understand it is because of how much of a minority I am. So it's just a real thing. Like, and, and I even say this, you know, in the book as well, people are like, oh, you don't know what it's like to walk down the street as a black man, though. And I'm like, yeah, I don't. But you also don't know what it's like to live as a black man inside a white man's body. And why are we even why is this a competition? Like, right. I, I'm not mad at you for the things you've gone through. Why are you mad at me for expressing my life, my truth and who I am? And even this right here is a hot take here. Here is a man who is comfortable with who he is who is just spitting facts right now. This is just truth, but because it has to do with race and because I got white skin and I, I, I like, you can't say this and the perception of it, but it's just like, it's a fucking crazy thing that there was a time in my career where people, where the world was openly racist towards me, but because of how I look, it was more like he wishes he was black. He, this, he, that it was kind of crazy. I mean, I'm past all that shit now, but it fucking hurt, man. It really hurt. Well, no, I can I can imagine because it's taking something that you've had to deal with your whole life and then acting as if you're somehow using it to your advantage uh, when clearly it wasn't to your advantage most of your life. It was funny, though, in the book. Did your dad just get the worst vasectomy of all time? Did your dad have two kids after a vasectomy? Is that, how's that even possible? Well, no, no, no. He had me. Yeah. And then he got a vasectomy. And then 30 years later. Oh, OK. Uh, but yeah, a friend of his uh, from the program from AA was dying and she was like, I want you to take care of my daughter. And he fucked her. He fucked he fucked her daughter. And uh, she was a heroin addict who would then go into overdose uh, and die from from heroin, which is extremely unfortunate. And 
their son is my little brother, Ashton. Yeah. And, and, and you want to talk about, you want to talk about like having impact, uh, right? You think about the multi-generational impact that your father has had through not positive means, right? And like, it's, I think it's so interesting, right? We, we, we want to be the biggest or the most famous or the most powerful uh, because then that'll create a legacy. Meanwhile, people are having legacies every single day through their children and that, that's like just not enough for them to focus on. It's not, that's like not that important. And so like when I think about whenever I'm getting caught up with like a work problem, I go like the real like when I think about my grandparents impact on me, that's three generations. I think, oh, the most important project I have is the is the one at home. I mean, he said it better than I can, man. I, I look at my boy and and I'm just like, dude, I just want to be a good dad. And I don't know how. Like he is this 19 month, you know, year and a half old little baby. How do you blow cigarette smoke constantly in a small fucking, you know, welfare, social security, you know, like box given to you from the government. And you're just this little baby. Me was inhaling this shit. How do you like get in fights and like, you know, seeing my mom get beaten by men or my sister's raped and sexually assaulted and coming home and all this like how do you do that to a child like i just don't get it so i think like hey man as long as i don't smoke crack i think the kid's gonna be all right like (laughs) that's it so yeah has that been helpful for you i was talking to, to someone about this recently and you know i think sometimes it can be hard to imagine what it was like to be a child or to be yourself in your own childhood i think like i i kind of have my childhood was traumatic like yours, but it, it wasn't the best. And and uh, having a kid now helps me understand because I can see my kid interact with my parents and I go, yeah. oh, this is how they treat four year olds. Right. Not great. Right. Like this, th- like not not abusive in any way, but not not conducive to being well adjusted. Right. Like this is a, and, and I see this with my in-laws who I love uh, quite a bit. You just you just see how. Uh, people of a certain generation interact with children. And then you go, yeah. Oh, it must've been really hard for me when I was five years old or six years old or 10 years old or 17 years old. You know, you, you I think having kids helps you have empathy for your younger self in a way that's difficult to do. I think uh, it's weird. I, I think that's especially true for people kind of in our generation, right? Because things are more open mental health and these discussions and us as teenagers trying to like wrestle with our emotions and our feelings and then finding other people who feel that way and blah, blah, blah. So I think in many ways we're like emotionally wiser than our predecessors for sure. Yeah. But there's, I think there's also, there, there's also always been really great parents out there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you really hit the nail on the head, dude. Like when I think about how I was treated as a kid, like, and every day wasn't bad. It's not like every single day was screaming and crying and, you know, we had like a a good Tuesdays every now and then. But, uh, but yeah, so for, I I, I feel you, man. It's weird. Yeah. Cause you talk about in the book, you're like, at the time I thought this was cool. And you're like, now as an adult, I'm like, I shouldn't have been watching this television show with my mom. You know, like you, you kind of get, it's like in the moment you think one thing. And then as you get older, you're like, I should not have been in that situation at all. That's insane. Dude. Yeah, it's like even even there's there's a story about uh, me experience like being sexually uh, assaulted as a kid, which I didn't really th- realize. And even now I look back and it's funny, but the long story short is like my dad's girlfriend. I was eating Skittles and she had me come over and she put some Skittles in her mouth and passed them from her mouth to my mouth, and uh, she looked like a skeleton with Van Halen hair. And uh, yeah, and then we started tongue kissing. And it's just like the most disgusting thing. Like if, if a man does that to a little girl, it's like, oh my God, but there's some right. weird part of like, if it's a woman and I was little, so I was kind of like noise. Like I was like, awesome. You know, but now I look back and I'm like, oh no, that is like, that's horrible. Like that's not a good thing at all. So how have you dealt with some of that stuff now? I know you mentioned going to therapy and stuff, but how have you worked? Cause I mean, that's not, none of that is normal and probably none of it is healthy to just carry around. 
Um, I don't know, dude. I, I don't know how I'm here today. So like, that's the, that's the, you know, it's just like, it never affected me. It's weird. Like it did, but I would deal with it. Even in that moment of being like noise, there was a part that was like, Oh, but also gross. Like there's something that wasn't right sure. about that. Um, you know, seeing my dad smoke crack. Oh, let's not smoke crack. You know, seeing my mom being beaten by men, other kids would grow up to then beat women. You know, it's, uh, I just was like, no, we, we're not going to do this. We're going to treat women good. We're not going to steal. We're going to be kind. We're not going to tell lies. And I've, you know, I talk about some fucked up shit that I've done in this book. I've done some, I, I'm not the, the not, you know, I wasn't like the best kid. I've stolen from friends. I spit in people's Gatorades. We know about that. Like, yes. And, but, but those things shaped me. It was those eternal sunshine of a spotless mind, Joel, you know, as Jim Carrey moments, killing this bird and realizing like, Oh, I feel horrible. So every time I did make a mistake, I think I learned from it. I think most people don't, or they feel bad in the moment, bury it down and then forget about it. And then kind of continue to make the same mistakes. Yeah. Well, you thank your dad at the end, right? For showing you how not to be a dad. You know, it's funny, man. I was doing my thank yous and I like, I feel so bad, but I don't. Because people are like, damn, you say some crazy shit in this book, right? Because it's like, my dad is just a piece of shit. Like, you know what I mean? But like, there's a part of me that still loves him. Sure. Like I, I, I texted, we were texting for a while. And then I was like, you know, this book is about to come out. And I was like, I don't want calls and texts from my dad about how I'm lying and none of it's true and blah, blah, blah. Because he either is denying it himself or was too like high on crack cocaine to even remember leaving me in a car sure. or X, Y, Z. So I blocked him right now. He's blocked my phone and in a month or two, I'll unblock him and I'll call him normal and just say, Hey dad, how's it going? <laughs> you know, and we can have that conversation then, but yeah, it's, it's insane. Those sound like very, very good boundaries. I mean, that sounds like what you're doing. Yeah. But back to the, <laughs> to the, you know, acknowledgements of the book. Um, it was very difficult to actually write that, even that thing. I basically thank my dad. I say my, to my dad, thank you so much for showing the man that I never wanted to be become. Uh, that's like the most fucked up thing you can kind of say to somebody, but it's the truth. Like I talk about my mother, my brothers, my sisters, my father. It is just so honest. And in many ways, I'm sure you read it and you're like, damn like it almost seems like i'm well sometimes i am comedically making fun of people and joking but i also explain how like we make fun of each other and blah 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 but for the most part it's like yeah like it's true like D donna my dad's girlfriend when i was a little kid looked like a skeleton with van halen hair like i'm a storyteller like yeah. that's the best way you want to hear it. you you want to hear that you know and i think it's also adding you know just comedic value is how I also kind of coped with things, you know, like being creative and trying to be funny and blah, blah, blah. It's just how you, how you deal with it. Like, you know, I, I got this, uh, I got this line about uh, that. I don't even know where it's going to go. I don't know what it is. It's like a horrible joke, but it's like, you know, uh, yeah, I was uh, black and white and everybody in my family's black. And, and I remember uh, I went to school and all, all the, all the black kids, I saw them. It was the first day of school and I went over to go hang with them. And then I hear, Oh shit, it's a white boy. Let's kick his ass. And I'm like, yeah, let's kick his ass. And then before I know it, I'm getting my ass kicked. And then I walk home after, after school and I'm all bloody and I've got a fat lip and I go home and I'm looking at all my brothers and my sisters and my dad and everybody's all black. And I'm looking at my skin. And I'm like, did you guys leave me in a house fire or something? So it's like, <laughs> I don't know that it's the best joke, but I've had this joke in my head for like five years. And it's because of how actually hard it was, how like that just shows that that joke says, oh, I identify with black folks because everybody in my family is black besides my mother. And yet when I go with the people that I identify with, that I am a part of their culture and grew, grow up and know everything that they know because I am them, but I'm not, how can I make that funny and deal with that pain while also doing it in a way that's like, therapeutic at the same time and whether it's a stupid joke like that or a rap you know on an album the craziest part is when you can accept that when you can get through it when you can deal with it creatively instead of through self-harm or drugs abuse substance and then the entire world makes jokes about you being biracial and all that i mean just imagine that dude like it's it's a difficult thing but luckily i've grown from it
Yeah, I mean, that the, the one benefit of an artistic career is that you get to take all of that stuff, all of the pain, all of the struggle, all of the the alienation and the mistakes and all of the one benefit of this profession is that you get to use that stuff in a way that if you were a banker would not be of the same value. Yeah, for sure. I mean, maybe for fun alone, but yeah. Yeah. You, but I'm just saying you can't, if you're a banker, you can't just choose, you can't just take the trauma of your childhood and turn that into deals, right. In the way that as an (laughs) artist, it becomes your work product. It becomes actually the source of your alienation becomes the source of your connection with the audience. It's a be- art is a beautiful thing, and then it transforms uh, pain and loss and suffering uh, into connection and beauty and uh, art. I agree. I think one of the hardest part parts of being an artist is actually releasing the art for a bunch of people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about right. to tell you how they feel about it. And the craziest part about that too, I struggle with. I go back and forth. Is well, if everybody says they love it. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. But then if somebody says, oh, no, this this isn't good. But it's like, well, we're still then holding value in what people are saying. Because if they love it, we're like, you got it. But if they say you hate it, we're like, you don't understand it. But at the end of the day, I don't think art is really meant to be understood or not. I think we just got to put it out and know that we did that for us. Like, first and foremost, we did it for ourselves. And we did it for the people we do hope that it will connect with. And yet, just like walking into an African plane, you know, 2000 years ago, the first thing you're going to look for are the lions. And when you're in a comment section, after you release a new song, the f- you're, I love you. This is amazing. This is incredible. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You fucking suck. Eat, right. Eat you look for the threats. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't get it. No, I think realizing that it's all bullshit is really helpful and that none of it is really of value. Like I, I, I have this weird thing in, in how my work has come out where like, uh, most of my work was sort of not critically received or uh, appreciated, but it sold very well, resonated well with the audience. Then the book that I'm most proud of was the most critically received, well received, but sold the fewest copies. And you're just like, OK, the, the compass doesn't matter. It only matters what you think. Right. Like it only matters if you're proud of it, if you think it's your best work. That's really the only thing you control and the only thing you should measure you should measure by the inner scorecard, not the outer scorecard, because it's the only one that you have really any consistency with. I agree. It's just sometimes it's just hard to do, dude. You know, because it's like, like my worst quote unquote album is an album that came out in 2019 called Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. And it was like my most popular, most talked about, most loved or hated, had some of, some of my biggest songs on it, one of them with Eminem. Like, it's just funny how that works. Like, it's it's such a weird thing. And I loved it. I love it. I never understood the hate. And then, like, years later, people are like, oh, oh confessions. Like, I love that. I love that. Or even even uh, from my first novel, Supermarket, that I wrote, which was super fun. And it was – you want to talk about therapeutic, dude. Like, that that whole thing, like – I was so depressed and ridden with anxiety and I just wrote up, like took that main character and just wrote it like it was me and I didn't do it for anybody else. And I actually came out on the other side, like so much stronger and better. And then people could say, Oh, this book sucks or, or, or I get it or this or that or whatever, who gives a shit. But I did a soundtrack for it and people, and it was like indie kind of like indie rock alternative stuff. And it was the first time I'd ever done it. And we all have to start somewhere. Sure. And I'm happy with how it turned out. I love it. But people just, shit on it dude like they were like this is garbage like this is the worst thing you could have ever done you've fallen off you've this you've that you blah 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 blah. and now it's like people can't get the vinyls anywhere it's become this like sacred holy grail of like logic vinyls and and music it's and 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 now every now and again like even just for fun like i'll release a song on youtube won't even really tell anybody about it maybe i'll tweet it out only real core fans will know about it. And there's some songs I've done more alternative or folky. And they're like, oh, supermarket vibes, my favorite. I'm like, get the fuck out of it. Well, and to think also you're, you know, you're mentioning an album that came out in 2019. The time you're, you're looking at a time span of three years, right? You know, some, some of these things take years to shake out is sort of where they fit. So, so that's the other thing, you know, and I, why I think the inner scorecard is more important is like, okay, what if it was garbage? And people really appreciated it at the time. And then uh, as time passed, it became seen as the garbage that it was. What if it was amazing? It was seen as terrible. And then 
30 years after you die, it finally gets the shake that it deserves, right? All, all of that is that, and that happens. I mean, there's so many examples of that happening. So at the end of the day, you kind of just got to go like, what matters is like, did I do what I was capable of doing? And is it close to what my vision was when I set out to do it? I think that's all you control. Right. Literally every project I've ever released was never as good as the one before it, like to people. Like sure. I released a mixtape. Oh, this is pretty cool. And then the next one's like, it's not as good as this. Not good as this. I, I'll never forget. I dropped my album. People were like, this artwork is trash. Your it first album? Yeah. Uh, under Pressure. This artwork is trash. Under Pressure. That's the worst album title. Blah, blah, blah. He's totally, he's, he's not where he was with his mixtapes, which they said sucked. And then it's like, then I do my second album and they're like, what is this? An album about space, the incredible true story, garbage title. This is so whack. You don't belong in hip hop. You're rapping about sci-fi planets and Rubik's cubes and shit. And then I dropped my third album, everybody. And it's like biracial, like literally black people were like, this is all lives matter album. White people were like, this is, this demonizes white people. <laughs> like it just didn't fit anywhere. And now it's like people, people look back at those first two albums and they're like classic. These are like classic all time hip hop albums. And I'm just like, all right. <laughs> and you can't, you can't win. So you might as well not even play is, is how I think about it. Okay. La last question for no, you. Wait, 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 real, real quick. Yeah. When you, what you just said is why I retired. You can't win. So you might as well not even play. And I fucking feel that shit. And that's why I did it. And then I realized, no, I can play by myself. Yeah. Right. You can do it. You can do it for different reasons. It's like uh, play stupid yeah. games, win stupid prizes as the saying goes. But if you play a different game, uh, you know, you win. If you, if you're playing a game, which just against yourself, like, you're not going to lose, right? So that's how I think about it. Agreed. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. I I, I know you got to go. So I was thinking about... I mean, well, I got a little bit of time, dude. All right. Well, it's, it sounds like we're on the same page, too, as far as leaving and moving out in the middle of nowhere. I live outside Austin, Texas uh, on a farm for, for the same reason. But walk me through the process of deciding to get out of L.A. and live a different life. First and foremost, not to sound no type of way, but... When you're where I'm at financially, they'd be taxing you like 55%. Dog. Yeah. So sure. I was like, okay, I can't, I can't do this shit. So um, that was a big one. I mean, imagine that you make a million dollars, 55% of it is gone immediately. And we're not talking about commissions and business managers and management and attorneys and like who take their cut. Like we're talking about. That's a steep top. price to pay, especially if you don't like Los Angeles, which is the, the I'm, space that I'm I was not in. a yeah. steam guy. Yeah. Right. I'm not like, yeah. I'm not like at, you know, don't get me wrong. There's a couple of restaurants I like. I like going to Nobu. It might sound bougie, but I like good sushi, shit like that. But I was yeah. like not at the club. Yeah. You know, I'm a married man. What am I doing at the club? I'm not at the club. Unless unless I'm paid to be there to like rap and then get the fuck out of there. Sure. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, so it was that. It was having a child. I, I didn't necessarily want, you know, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I mean, my wife was born there and she's awesome, but it just wasn't for me. It just didn't feel right. It was also like, it's the desert. Like when you really think about it, it's like the desert and uh, Los Angeles is the yeah. desert. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, you can't, there's no like vegetation. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like tumbleweeds and shit. So I was like, all right, I want to go somewhere lush. I really love Maryland, but I don't want to go back there. Um, so I'll try to find some. And we found a really beautiful uh, house in Utah. It's funny. Cause we looked all over. We looked in Japan, we looked in London, we looked in Canada, we looked all over the States, just all, just like, where could we live? That could be amazing. But we found like the most beautiful house here. And um, who knows how long we'll even be here. I, I'm like nomadic in that way, but, uh, but we loved it and we're here and it's so quiet and slow and we just hang out and shoot guns and watch movies and chill, man. It's great. No, I know that. I know that vibe very well. And, you know, I think it actually makes it easier to, to, to do art the way you're talking about, where if you're not running into a bunch of people who do the same job as you, it's easier not to compare yourself and to just do what you think is good at your own schedule. It's also been very humbling because, like, I get recognized for sure. But like a lot of the time, dude, like I don't out here especially like, like I would go in LA. It's just, it's LA. Like I'd go to like the store for 
coconut water. And it's just like, oh, Lord, she's, oh, my God, like immediately like pulling their phone out and shit. And that's cool. But then it kind of gets old. So then when I moved here, I was like, ah, oh, nobody really knows who I am. And then I was like, oh, my God, am I falling off? Am I not? Do, do people not care about me anymore? And, but I kind of like it because who knows if, if I will continue to be a big name in, in music or if I'll just kind of be a guy who had like a really great run and has a solid fan base and he makes music and now I'm getting into film. So am I going to be more known for that in 10 years? Am I this or that? Who knows? But it's been like a nice wind down of kind of just realizing I don't need to be this huge mega celebrity, whatever bullshit, you know, and, and I like, and I like it at first it was difficult. And sometimes it still is. Like I actually had a, I cried like a week ago in bed with my wife because I was like, and it was, it was a happy, it was a weird cry. It wasn't really a sad cry. It was like that part of my life is over. Yeah. Like that, like it just, it just is now by my own doing Seinfeld season nine, motherfucker. Like I don't want to do a bunch of interviews and talk about BS. I don't want to be on Instagram all the time. I don't want to go do interviews with people who don't care about me and don't even know just because I'm a hot topic. I don't want to be in the studio like, okay, what's hot right now? What's Drake rapping on? What's this? Like, no, I don't want to do that. And because I don't want to do that, I know that maybe the music that I'm going to make here on out might not necessarily be the most popular. I'll still do hundreds of millions of play, plays and on Spotify and, da, da, and that's great. But it's different. But I had to really, yeah, it's different. It's totally different. And just, dude, my main fo- like literally, like I said, is this film that I wrote. Like, it's like, that's all I care about right now. No, that's amazing. I think it's more sustainable too. I think that that's the other thing. It's, it's like, you know, when you're not a professional athlete, you're worried about your body collapsing at any moment. How can you set up a lifestyle or a career that you actually can do it as long as you want to do it? I think that's important. And I think asking yourself, like, why, you know, like you said, sure. enough, I'll tell you this, man, I have enough money. You know what I mean? Like I have enough, like, it doesn't need to be this. I used to look back on 2018, my $30 million year, my, you know, biggest song in the world, all this other stuff. And I used to be scared. Like, I hope this isn't the pinnacle. Like, I hope this isn't the height of me as logic. Like I really, I really hope. And then I started being like, well, why not? I mean, it That'd was be pretty great good. Yeah, you made a lot of money. You made an impact. So what if that's your biggest year and you're headlining Lollapalooza for 100,000 people? Maybe maybe you do that again. Maybe you don't. And the crazy part is, is that I know I can do it. Like if I want to, I can call, you know, I don't know, Marshmallow or so and say, be like, yo, let's get the band back together, man. We going, we going. But why? Like there, like for me, it's like, if I'm going to do a song with Marshmallow, it's just because we're homies and it'll be fun. Now it's not to, it's not the strategic, like, okay, if we got Logic and Marshmallow on a record and we got it, now it's just like, no, 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 no. Like, like literally I'm working on an album right now that I haven't really talked about. Um, and it is just so fun. It's just some raw, it's some raw hip hop tribe called quest shit. That's like, so not even popular and I'm doing it because I love it. And that, and that's it. That's all that matters. That's the best, man. I'm very happy for you. That is uh, that's the bright future, right? Getting to do what you want when you want it. hundred percent. Dude, it was so awesome to me. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being good at what you do, man. Cause ah. it's always really cool to, yeah, seriously, to like speak with somebody who takes the time and actually cares, uh, you know, to talk to uh, the person about things, that matter to them. And I feel like we're very like-minded in, in, in that way. So thank well, you. Well, I think what I'm actually good at is writing books. This is just something, you know, you also do, but uh, I, I think you'd like the books uh, if, if you ever checked them out. Oh, dude, a hundred percent. Actually, I'm going to order them all. JT, make sure I do that. I'm not lying. All right. I have to study and I love to, I just love to buy books. It's like bad because I haven't read all of them, but I like, you know what I mean? But I just love it. I love to be surrounded by books and I'm definitely excited to, uh, to yeah check out your stuff you're a very articulate man well thank you um, yeah i'm excited well hit me up hit me up if you like them and we'll uh we'll stay in touch okay man i'm really sorry i was five minutes late never happened dude i promise not a a problem at all this is awesome more than i expected i appreciate it all right cool man you have a great day you too all right bye all right